We're here celebrating a very special anniversary, the 225th anniversary of the Constitution. And it is wonderful to see such, such an amazing crowd uh, out to come and hear this lecture. It really does warm my heart. I'd like to start by thanking uh, a few people. Uh, first, I'd like to thank our co-sponsor, the College of Law. Uh, I'm, well, I'm Kyle Harper. I'm welcoming you on behalf of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage. And our partners at the College of Law have brought you this uh, wonderful program this evening. And I, I want to start by thanking uh, the person above all who's made this possible. And that's the university president uh, who truly believes in civic education and the value of, of civic education and believes in the power of OU and the power of higher education to promote civic education. So let's thank President David Boren for making this possible. I'd also like to thank the ICH staff who've worked hard to make this possible. I'd like to thank the ICH faculty uh, who do so much to make our program a success and to make uh, the Constitutional Studies curriculum at OU a reality. Um, it's, it's really pleasing to see such a, such a diverse crowd, to see a mix of students and alumni and friends from around the community, to see faculty here. And to me, this kind of crowd uh, epitomizes what the IACH is truly about and what we can make higher education truly about, and that is uh, broad civic education. And the, the ICH was founded just over two years ago by President Boren to make civic education, to make citizenship training a uh, priority at the University of Oklahoma. And uh, I, for one, think that university mottos ought to mean something, and that's not just because I like Latin. Um, the, the motto of Harvard is Veritas, which is a wonderful motto. It just means the truth. And then, of course, Yale has a kind of inferiority complex and <laughs> feels like it has to. <laughs> President Warren's guffawing here in the front row. <clears throat> feels like it has to one-up Harvard. So it's Lux et Veritas, right? Is that correct? OK. Uh, light and truth. Uh, and uh, what's the motto of the University of Oklahoma? Good. A few people, you always get a few people who've noticed it. The funny words on the seal with the sower that you, that you haven't stopped to think about enough. Uh, it's Kiwi et Republicae, for the citizen and for the country. Uh, it's an amazing motto. I, I think it, it's the best motto of any university in the country. It, it, it symbolizes what we're truly about, for the citizen and for the country. It means that higher education can, can make people into better citizens. And it means that the role of higher education is fundamentally, especially at a public university, is for the public good, is for the country's good. And uh, the power of higher education in citizenship training is truly unlimited, and I think sadly, to a large extent, it's untapped. Universities don't do enough consciously to think about how they can promote the practices and values of good citizenship. And the, the mission of the ICH first is to teach citizenship to our students, to do what we can to build a multidisciplinary curriculum that teaches students the foundations that they must have to be effective citizens. Second mission is to be a hub for the, for the community. And that's why I'm so happy to see so many members uh, who, are, who are not in college, but are alumni and friends of the university here with us today. And I truly want to, to bring the ICH, to bring its resources and talents to the, to the community. And one way we're going to be doing that, that I have to stop and make a short advertisement for, is through the power of the internet. I was, I was giving a talk about a year ago at the OU Alumni Club of Dallas, and I was bragging about the IECH and the things that we've done in two years. We've hired three new faculty. We've built an affiliate of faculty of 30 faculty, a uh, wide range of political and disciplinary backgrounds uh, to come together and contribute to this program. We've, uh, we've created a curriculum in constitutional studies that makes OU the only top-tier university in the entire country where an undergraduate can focus their education on the American Constitution. That's an amazing, amazing brag fact for the University of Oklahoma, and it makes me really proud of this university. The, the, uh, don't, the, the alumnus at the, university, at the Dallas Alumni Club said, when I told him about these 30 courses we've created in two years, the Constitution and the economy, religion and the Constitution, American constitutional history, and so on, said, I really wish I could take those courses. And uh, I said, well, you know, we could, we could find a way to put these on the internet and bring them to you. And so one of our big goals this year is to create a web presence for the ICH. And next month we'll launch um, freedom.ou.edu. 
which will bring a variety of civic education resources that are exciting, that are uh, educational to the public, to our alumni, to our friends throughout the state and throughout the country. So I want you to sign up. I want you to give us your email address out there. And if you put your email address on our list, then you'll be notified about these programs as they roll out. You'll also be entered to win a free copy of Akhil Amar's new book, uh, America's Unwritten Constitution. I'm also uh, told that this is called a hashtag, is that correct? <laughs> is that right? Yes, okay. If you, if you tweet this hashtag, then you will, you'll also be entered to win a free copy of Professor Amar's book. So tweet, number sign, Constitution OU. And you, I don't know why they're laughing at me. And you will be, you will be entered to win a free copy of the book. More importantly, you'll be notified when we launch a truly amazing uh, digital civic education initiative next month that brings the ICH and its rich resources to a broader audience than ever before. So enough about our program. Let me, let me introduce very briefly uh, and hand the microphone over to Akhil Amar. Uh, it, is, it is an honor to have him back on campus. If you're at our teach-in last February, uh, you know what a treat it is to have him on uh, in our presence. And he's the, the only speaker I've ever talked to. When I first called him, got him on the phone, and said, would you, would you please come to this teaching? This is going to be a special event. We're bringing together the best teachers. Nobody's ever done anything like this. We're going to bring the best teachers from around the country onto campus for a day, not to present their research, but to teach. He said, I'll come, but on one condition. I think, oh, here we go. What's it going to be? He says, if I can come twice, if I can come back, Okay, you, you can come twice. And sure enough, it turns out sometimes people will say, oh, I'd love to come back, and it's just a nice thing that people say. But he actually meant it, uh, and he followed up and said, I really will, I'd like to come back, I'll be, I'll be in that part of the country in September when I'm launching a, a new book. And so this is the fulfillment of, of his promise and my promise to him uh, that we could get two for one and have him back onto our campus. He was uh, an, an amazing day of teaching. He was the speaker that I got the most comments about and the most positive feedback about. So it's uh, truly exciting to have him back on campus. Uh, his his uh, accomplishments are extraordinary. Uh, he is one of the top constitutional scholars in the country today. Uh, you'll see a pattern in his education. He received his BA, summa cum laude, in 1980 from Yale College. He received his JD uh, from Yale Law School and he is now Sterling Professor of Law at Yale Law School. He clerked for, uh, the, for Judge Stephen Breyer on the U.S. Court of Appeals First Circuit. He is author of a number of highly respected books, uh, Processes of Constitutional Decision Making, The Constitution and Criminal Procedure, First Principles, The Bill of Rights, Creation and Reconstruction, America's Constitution and Biography, and the book which you are able to buy at an extraordinarily reasonable price outside uh, the doors there, and which he will be signing after this event, America's Unwritten Constitution, the precedents and principles we live by that will be out, that is just out uh, about two weeks ago. Let me just uh, hand the microphone over to him by saying two things that I, that I truly admire about him. One is that he is across the spectrum, one of the most respected constitutional scholars. And you can just look at the people who blurb his book on the back. I don't know that you could even get these people into the room together. Uh, they disagree amongst each other so much. But his, his scholarship is so serious and his, his mind is so fair that people on the left and people on the right uh, take him seriously, respect him, and learn from him. And that's, that's truly a, a credit uh, to your values and to your scholarship. And the second thing that I truly admire about him is his writing. He, he considers himself a communicator. And there aren't too many people who write books on constitutional law that, that both challenge uh, professional legal scholars who spend their entire careers worrying about constitutional interpretation, uh, and his books truly do that, but at the same time become bestsellers because they communicate in clear language to a broad public audience. And he truly believes in that, in that democratic mission uh, of the academy. And he is telling me today that it comes straight out of teaching undergraduates. So he's uh, in, uh, appointed in the law school, but also teaches Yale undergraduates. And it's those experiences that inform his writing and make him probably the most read constitutional scholar uh, in the United States today. And so that's truly a virtue, and it's one of the reasons that we're truly lucky to welcome to the University of Oklahoma campus, Akhil Reed Amar.
President, Mrs. Boren, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much. Um, uh, uh, what Kyle didn't tell you, because I'm shameless, is that I actually now today managed to invite myself back yet again. So like Douglas <laughs> MacArthur, I shall return. I hope I can come back again and again and again. I, I love this place. I love you all. And I had never been here uh, until um, uh, last February, and the, just the energy I felt from, from folks in, in that room, it, it was like nothing I had ever felt before, and that's why I actually not only wanted to come back, but come back on a very special day. So let me tell you about um, uh, this special moment that we have together. It's because it's a double anniversary. 225 years ago this week, the world changed. It's the hinge of human history. If you're Christian, you believe basically the world divides into BC and AD. What I want to persuade you of is that um, for uh, basically how our planet actually operates, the world is divided into the, the millennia before September 17th, this, you know, this week, um, um, 1787, and the 225 years after that. So here's what happened. Before September 1787, there's basically no democracy um, in the planet, almost anywhere. For millennia, um, going all the way back even to ancient Greece, you have a few democratic regimes practicing self-government in tiny little Greek city-states or pre-imperial Rome or Florence. And these are people who speak the same language and worship the same gods and meet face to face and, and then their little democratic experiments flicker out because um, um, they can't militarily sustain themselves. So that's the history of planet Earth. No democracy almost anywhere. You look at the planet in 1787 and outside the United States, who, who has self-government? It's um, uh, the Brits, to some degree, they do have a House of Commons, they do have a jury system, but they have a hereditary monarch and a House of Lords, and, and the hereditary monarch is very powerful still at the time, so some self-government there. A few goat herders and sheep herders in Switzerland. You know, there are no Swiss banks, and uh, Mitt Romney hasn't parked his money there yet, so, <laughs> so you know, it, it, and then a few folks in Holland and the Netherlands that are in the process of losing their republic right at this moment. That's it in the world. China, despotism. Russia, despot the Russia's despotism. Um, India is in chains. Africa is in chains. Most of Europe, the, the people who run the world are kings, czars, sultans, um, Mughal lords, tribal chieftains. So that's um, um, the world. Thugs, basically. And now look at today's world. Half the planet is democratic. A billion people in India actually have a constitution, that's where my parents were born, on the model of the United States, multicultural, multi-religious, across a continent or subcontinent, a vast space, half the world's in. What happened between no democracy practically anywhere for 2,000 years um, or more, just all of recorded history, and today, the world that we live in, the world that is increasingly an American world? What happened is that 225 years ago this week, that's why I wanted to be with you at this special time, a document emerged from a secret conclave whose first sentence was, we, the people of the United States, dot, 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 do ordain and establish this constitution. They were gonna put the thing to a vote across a continent, it never before happened. And that is the big bang um, of our political universe and we're still feeling its reverberations. Up and down a continent, people getting to vote, and not just vote, and I'm gonna say now a little bit more about this, but speak freely. A year of free speech up and down a continent where you could be for the Constitution or against it, and no one was gonna put you in jail or vote you off the island. Uh, we get the idea of ostracism from the ancient Greeks who did vote people off the island. Um, so look, that didn't happen, in, and, and let's take, just take the people who opposed the Constitution. We call them anti-federalists, but you can oppose the Constitution and later become President of the United States, James Monroe, Vice President of the United States, Elbridge Gerry, um, George Clinton, Supreme Court Justice, Samuel Chase, um, 
Now, um, and what, what else happens to these people that are anti-federalists? They, they lose the vote on the Constitution, but they kind of win the next round. They're the ones who really say there should be a Bill of Rights. And the moderates on the other side say, you know, you're right. So let's moderates get together, moderate federalists, moderate anti-federalists. Let's come up and make the system even better. Let's have a series of, of amendments. The amendments say, what's the word that appears in most of the first 10 amendments, more a phrase, in more of the amendments than any other? It's the phrase, the people. The right of the people in the First Amendment to assemble, to keep and bear arms in the Second Amendment, to, in the Fourth Amendment, you see the words the people, and the Ninth and the Tenth, and that's not a coincidence. It says the people because it's coming up from the people. It, so it's coming up, so, so, so in effect, the Constitution is crowdsourced. Um, 1.0 was flawed, and they put it out to a Wikipedia-like thing, um, and all sorts of people you know, put their two bits in, and we ended up with a Bill of Rights that made the system better. And so a process of amendment began. And isn't epic and amazing that our amendments in general have made our Constitution better? There have been very few bad amendments. Um, almost all of them have expanded liberty and equality, and that's because in this year, this audacious year, this epic year, the year that changed, I claim, everything in human history, the hinge of human history, an entire planet for a year got to talk about freely, openly, how they and their posterity would be governed. That didn't happen in 1776. 1776 is a great year. I'm for it. Um, <laughs> but not a vote, because we're in the middle of a war, you can't take a vote. Um, uh, and, and but the, the, the uh, uh, Lexington, Battle of Lexington's already occurred and conquered and Bunker Hill and we're already in a war and, and so we can't take a vote and we can't really have a lot of free speech because the King of England has sent 30,000 troops um, over and, and as soon as they land, this is not, a t this, this is, this is not um, um, just a, a parlor game. When they arrive, they are going to kill us. Um, and if we lose the revolution, you know, we will, the people who signed the Declaration of Independence, they're pledging their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor. Benjamin Franklin says, if we don't hang together, we will assuredly hang separately, and he means hanged by the neck until he is dead. Uh, so this is not a game. So in 1776, either you're with us or you're against us. And if you're not with us, then here are your choices. One, leave. Two, shut up. That's it. There's no other choice. We're in the middle of a life and death war. So no one who opposes the Declaration of Independence goes on to any position of political authority in, in independent America. They, in effect, are voted off the island. It's, it's, an, it's, you know, it, it's a good year. It makes possible 1787. But it's not the year that changes everything in human history. A year where ordinary people across a continent are allowed to vote. Property qualifications are eliminated or, um, uh, or reduced in eight of the 13 states, and there's audacious free speech. That's the 225th anniversary that we mark now. That's why I wanted to be with you at this special moment. The hinge of modern world history. It gives us the world that we have today, which is a product only of the political, I ideological, economic, military success of the United States of America. It's also, but there, 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 were, there were problems. And one of them is, what about the folks who aren't part of we the people? Um, most dramatically, what about slaves in our midst? They're not getting to vote or participate. This was the, the flaw, the, 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 the sin in the original Constitution. And it's amazing today, and that's not our world, that was the framers' world, a world of slavery. And what's utterly amazing is that we, this week, not only mark the 225th birthday of the Constitution, but I told you it was a double anniversary, we mark the 150th anniversary, the sesquicentennial this week of the Emancipation Proclamation. The Battle of Antietam, the bloodiest day of fighting in American history up to that point, was fought on September 17, 1862, 75 years to the day um, uh, after the, the Constitution went public um, in, in Philadelphia. Um, and, and so Lincoln, you know, who is trying to actually discern God's will 
and he, and they don't, he doesn't live in an age of miracles anymore, he thinks. So, so God's will is not all, always sort of manifest, and he wants to be on God's side. And, but it is pretty extraordinary, almost providential, that this epic battle of Antietam is fought on the 75th anniversary, and the Union prevails. McClellan doesn't follow up, um, but the Union prevails. Um, and so he decides he will issue the Emancipation Proclamation um, in September, the, uh, uh, September 22nd. 1862, 75 years, excuse me, um, um, 75 years after the Constitution um, went public, 150 years ago this week, and that is gonna put America on a, an irrevocable path of ending slavery. It's gonna lead to the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, the next great series of liberation amendments after the Bill of Rights. It's gonna, again, create a second burst of energy and Big Bang propelling and, and, and momentum of, a, of ultimately a project of bringing more people into the system of we the people and getting rid of the biggest problem uh, at the founding. So it's an amazing double anniversary that we uh, mark today, 200, uh, this week, 225 and 150. Um, 150, by the way, here's the word sesquicentennial. That's the 150th anniversary of something. Okay, so I hope I've said enough to persuade you that I have extraordinary respect and reverence for this written constitution, and especially after its amendments in the wake of the Civil War. And we could talk about women's suffrage too, and I think I will end up talking about the 19th Amendment at some point, because it's a rather important thing, talking about we the people, because you know, half of you all really wouldn't quite have been part of that we the people vote at least 225 years ago, and you all now are. So we'll talk about the 19th Amendment too, I hope. So I have extraordinary reverence for this co written constitution. My last book was all about the written constitution from start to finish. But what I'm here to tell you today is that there is so much more to the American constitutional project than the 8,000 words of this document. That this document um, needs to be supplemented by an unwritten constitution, not supplanted. Nothing in here we want to take away from. We fought too hard to get these words in the document. Um, but there are other things that are also part of the American constitutional system that aren't here in so many words. It doesn't say proof beyond reasonable doubt. It doesn't say the rule of law. It doesn't say in so many words limited government and separation of powers and federalism. Um, uh, or the right of privacy, or one person, one vote, or the idea that separate is inherently unequal. It doesn't say all those things in so many words, but those are all part of our constitutional tradition and, and more. Um, so here's the challenge, here's the trick. How do we keep everything that we rightly r revere about this written document even as we go beyond it? And so I'm gonna offer a few ways of going beneath behind, beyond the written constitution without ever losing a sufficient connection to the written constitution, because that's an important. I mean, that we, that we be, um, we can't read this literally. We have to read it faithfully, and faithfully means attending to its spirit as well as its letter. You know, um, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life, uh, says the gospels. Actually, it's the epistles, but, um, uh, so, um, so let me give you some examples of America's unwritten constitution, the precedents and principles we live by. And, and, um, and one test, Kyle mentioned it, this shouldn't seem left or right to you, red or blue, Democrat or Republican. I want to give you, it's very much in the David Bourne tradition, you know, of, of, um, America's Constitution and not a, um, one side or the other. Um, so uh, maybe let's, let's start with a little um, parlor game. And if, you, if any of you have seen this game, I've played it in some other audiences, sometimes it's on C-SPAN. If you've played it, then just forbear, because let's let folks who don't know the answer, let's just see if this works. This could be a total flop, we'll see. This is not the only iconic text that makes us, that sort of defines what it means to be an American, this written constitution, these 8,000 words. This is our 
This is what makes us Americans. This is our Queen Elizabeth, our Taj Mahal. It, it's what we, you know, but it's not the only thing that, that brings us all together, north and south, red and blue, liberal and conservative. There are other iconic texts stating sort of basic principles about what it means, what we Americans believe in above and beyond this. Well, I have one chapter telling you what some of those other things that are part of our symbolic constitution. Um, what text would you nominate? Um, I can't give you all of them in the book. I give you six examples and I probably thought of 20 before I picked the final six. But well, if you were asked to pick um, you know, some examples of things not in this that, that, aren't, that aren't in the Constitution itself, but are, are comparable texts that, that constitute us, that make uh, that define what it means to be an American, what would you nominate for inclusion? Magna Carta is a possibility. Declaration of Independence, I picked that one. Brown v. Board, I picked that one. Common Sense made my uh, final list. Also on my list. Now, he's an English guy, so that was a little tricky. Magna Carta is English, so that's a little tricky. The Federalist Papers. Excellent. How about something also, any, anything else? I have Brown from the 20th century. Anything else from the 20th century? Some modern statement. I have a dream. Okay. So you all have just come up with five of my six, and some of the others were on my list. Declaration of Independence. Um, uh, Federalist Papers, Brown, I have, I have a dream. Oh, actually, I, I think I did um, have one other um, a presidential statement. What would you pick? You could pick the Emancipation Proclamation. I heard you. I picked the Gettysburg Address. I love Lincoln. I could have picked a lot of stuff from Lincoln. I could have just, you know, all Lincoln all the time. But, but here's the point. We just proved, and this could have exploded in my face. This was, you know, unrehearsed. We, I just proved to you that I'm not making it up, that this is what we all actually, left and right, you know, red and blue, north and south, this is what it means for us to be Americans. We all actually have these canonical texts at the core of our um, national conversation. So isn't that interesting? That we all come up with the same, and I, I've done this in venue after venue after venue, and I always come, I added one other thing that most people miss, um, but it's special to me, maybe because I was born in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and that's the Northwest Ordinance that played a particularly important role early on in American history, and I, I'll defend um, that one. I think it was hugely important for Lincoln and his generation, but maybe it's just the Michigander in me that, um, that has the special fondness for that. So I admit that that's um, um, the one that um, sometimes an eyebrow is raised about, but no one ever challenges when they, they say, well, if I say, like Brown versus the Board of Education, they say, oh, well, I didn't think about that, but now that you mention it, of course. And they say, but there are other things too. And I say, of course. You know, this is the core. We could, we could um, venture. Yeah. So one technique of unwritten constitutionalism is to think about these central texts in our national experience that help clarify when the written constitution isn't so clear on certain things. Some of these other texts may give us a little more specificity about what it means to be an American. OK, so that's one way of going beyond the text. Um, another way is looking at constitutional cases. And I have some chapters on the major constitutional cases of our era. They, these cases, they're written down, of course, but they're not, strictly speaking, part of this short little text. And um, so I tell you what some of the iconic cases are in the modern era. And I try to show you that these cases, like Brown versus Board of Education, actually line up with the Constitution, in fact. In Brown, um, the court actually takes seriously a word that really is in the Constitution. It really does say equal. Brown didn't make that up. Uh, and Brown is handed down by a unanimous Supreme Court led by a Republican Chief Justice, Earl Warren, with largely Democrat appointees as associate justices. It's not the only one. Um, so there are a whole bunch of central cases today um, that I say pretty much line up with the text of the Constitution. And so I'm trying to bring the case law into alignment with the terse text. Here is an, another um, way of, of trying to, because the danger is, well, once you start going beyond the text, you're just making stuff up, professor. Um, and, and we don't want judges to make stuff up, and we especially don't want to, 
the make stuff up that does violence to the written constitution and its principle. Okay, I gave you actually another um, example of an unwritten principle. I did so in the, um, before I even started talking about the unwritten constitution. Let's talk about freedom of speech. Now, if the only guarantee of freedom of speech is that it appears in the First Amendment, which was ratified in 1791, well, that would mean that the original Congress in 1790 and 1789 would have been free to violate free speech. If the only protection of the text, that they could have made it a crime to criticize members of Congress in 1790. And I say, no, that's preposterous. They couldn't have. Free speech is prior to the First Amendment. First Amendment says the freedom of speech as if it already exists before. It's not making something up. It's recognizing a pre-existing right. And if it was only the First Amendment, the First Amendment says, what's the first word of the First Amendment? Congress. Congress shall make no law abridging free speech and free press. Our friends in the Tea Party just say, Congress shall make no law, period. Um, just full stop. But, but, um, but if, it's, if it's only Congress that can't abridge free speech, if we're a textualist, well, can federal courts abridge free speech? Can the president abridge free speech? Mm, uh, president Bourne remembers the Pentagon Papers case, um, for example. Um, can states abridge free speech? And I say no, free speech is bedrock, is fundamental, it existed before the First Amendment, it's broader than the First Amendment. And someone says, prove it, professor. And I try to prove it several ways, here's one. The entire structure of the government depends on free elections. Free elections can't occur if the incumbents can shut down the challengers, make it a crime to criticize the incumbents. The entire structure of the Constitution is based on popular sovereignty. Here, the people rule. Government officials are our servants, our agents. They do our bidding. For them to try to shut us down is like your butler trying to tell you you can't speak at your own dinner table. They work for us. Popular sovereignty, fair elections. Free speech is part of, of political expression, free political expression is part of the basic structure of the Constitution, just like separation of powers. And you won't find the word separation of powers in the Constitution, or checks and balances, you won't find those words. Federalism, limited government. So it's in the structure of the thing. That's one argument, before the First Amendment comes along. And, the, and one technique is reading the Constitution, reading between the lines, going beyond the clauses to see the whole thing. That's, the Constitution doesn't tell us you have to read it that way. It's unwritten. The Constitution doesn't tell us how we're supposed to read it. The rules of constitutional interpretation are themselves unwritten to some important extent. But I just gave you one way. Look at the Constitution as a whole. Here's another reason for free speech that I gave you before. Free speech was part of the very process by which we the people ordained and established the Constitution. Without that free speech, you wouldn't even have the Constitution be ratified. It was baked into the cake even before the First Amendment. Not in what the Constitution said, but in what it actually did. We, the people, do ordain and establish. How did we do it? What did we do? We talked freely amongst ourselves for a whole year, and we voted fairly. Pretty amazing. And in that vote, by the way, it was one person, one vote. Um, in, uh, um, in, in the ratifying convention, and it was simple majority vote in each ratifying convention. Does the Constitution say that? The Constitution says nine of the 13 states have to say yes, but it doesn't tell you what the voting rule is supposed to be within each state. And it turns out the voting rule within each state is simple majority rule. In New York, the vote for the Constitution was 30 to 27, and the 30 beat the 27, and the 27 didn't squawk about it. They didn't peep, they, they, they said, okay, you beat us fair and square. Simple majority, and the text doesn't say that. It's just like it doesn't say that in the Supreme Court, five beat the four. It's unwritten, but it's elemental. And by the way, if that's true, what I just told you has radical implications for filibuster reform. Um, if simple majority rule is the, uh, is the deep, implicit constitutional principle, it means that tomorrow a majority of senators could actually change um, uh, the, the entrenched filibuster rule, notwithstanding what the entrenched filibuster rule, Rule 22, as in Catch 22, seems to say, um, in fact. And that's pretty interesting. It, this is sometimes called the nuclear option, what I just told you, the constitutional option. I give you some reasons for thinking that's true because it's baked into the very process 
by which we adopted the Constitution. Free speech, majority rule. I'll give you another reason for free speech since we're talking about free speech. Again, there are these different techniques. Read the Constitution as a whole. It's about popular sovereignty, fair and free elections, freedom of speech. Look at how the Constitution was actually adopted. It's all about free speech. Here's another thing. The Constitution says there are unenumerated rights. The Ninth Amendment says not all the rights in the Constitution are textually listed, are enumerated. It doesn't tell us where to find these rights quite, but it does say they're rights of the people. And I say, judges, here's where you should find rights of the people. Look to the people. Look at what they actually think and do every day. Look in their daily lives. Do they actually practice free speech? And if they do, that's actually an important piece of evidence that in America, Americans believe certain things to be their rights because they basically exercise them every day. This is a, a Burkean, a traditionalist, um, a custom-based vision of unenumerated rights. And it's not a philosophical, uh, judges come up with first principles idea. It's judges look at how ordinary people live their lives. The Constitution doesn't say in so many words you have a right to wear a hat, or to play the fiddle, or to sit on your, por your front porch and rock, um, um, uh, or to raise your children. Um, before the Second Amendment, it didn't say you had a right to have a gun in your home for self-protection. But American tradition, American practice says you have all those rights and many more. I tried to pick with that gun thing an example of a paradigmatically conservative right. Just so you see, this is not a Mars constitution. This is America's constitution, left, right, and center. The constitution, by the way, when you read it, it doesn't say that a criminal defendant has a right to take the stand in his own defense. And at the time the constitution was adopted, no criminal defendant, in fact, in America, could take the stand in his own defense. Um, and now, of course, every judge in America, every judge on the Supreme Court at least, left, right, and center, recognizes a right to take the stand in your own defense. Why? Not because we had it 200 years ago, because we, 225 years ago, because we didn't. Not because it's in the text, because it's not. Not because it was even in there at the time of the 14th Amendment after the Civil War, because it isn't, wasn't. It's because since the 1850s and increasingly, states basically began to recognize this right. And by 1900, all the states except Georgia recognized this right. It's, it's a newer right, but they recognized it. And then the Supreme Court came along and said, you know what? In America now, fair trials mean that the government has to allow you to take the stand in your own defense. And the Constitution doesn't say proof beyond a reasonable doubt, but Americans are in, in courtroom after courtroom are actually doing this. So now that's a basic right, and Georgia has to come on board. You see, the outlier has to come on board because because American practice has has evolved in, 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 in certain um, respects. The Constitution doesn't say in so many words you have a right to produce physical evidence of your innocence or to um, um, uh, some 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 piece of evidence that proves someone else did the crime, a, a bloody knife with someone else's fingerprints on it. It doesn't say you have a right to confront the physical evidence introduced against you. It doesn't say all sorts of things, but we have many unenumerated rights. The text itself tells us to go beyond the text in certain ways. Now, we have to have rules, though, for going beyond the text. We don't want judges just to make stuff up. And so I gave you one rule. The rights of the people are actually rights ordinary people engage in every day that are broadly respected in actual practice on the ground in state after state, um, in, um, uh, in region after region. Okay, so those are a few examples of how to find the unwritten constitution. I'll maybe give you one or two more and then maybe we can have a conversation. So read the constitution as a whole, read between the lines. Look at how the constitution was actually adopted um, um, and ratified in certain principles that were baked into the cake. Look at how ordinary people live their lives um, and, and embody certain rights in their, just their basic practices and, and habits and traditions and folkways. Look at what courts have said and try to see if what courts have said and done can be brought into harmony with the written constitution. Look um, at um, these other iconic documents like the Declaration of Independence and the I Have a Dream speech and Brown versus Board of Education and the Federalist Papers to give you guidance where the text is, is ambiguous. Um, um, maybe two more, there's more in the, in the book but we can't do everything just in the short time that we have together. When it, look at actual, not just um, citizen practice, 
government practice. Look at actually how government works and see if um, it can be aligned w with what the text says. The text doesn't say that presidents can fire cabinet officers at will. But that's been our practice for a very long time, that presidents can fire cabinet officers at will. In fact, it's been our practice ever since George Washington. And here's another related thing. Stuff that George Washington did has special constitutional significance. If you look at the actual powers of the presidency textually, very ambiguous. On issue after issue, what is decisive today is not what the text says, but what George Washington did. In the same way that Christians ask themselves, what would Jesus do? Constitutional scholars and presidents ask themselves, what would George Washington do? What did George Washington do? I'll give you examples. So today, can President Obama, if he wants to recognize the Syrian rebels, unilaterally, without getting the Senate to say, yes, he can. He recognized the Libyan rebels at a certain point. Does the text say that he can? It's not at all clear that the, textually he has this power. But George Washington unilaterally recognized the French revolutionaries when they had cut off um, uh, Louis' head. And so it's what George Washington did. Can the president secretly negotiate treaties um, without getting the Senate's pre-approval? He's going to need to come back to them to get them to actually agree to the treaty. But can he begin negotiations without telling the Senate? Yes, he can. Um, uh, Nixon sent um, Kissinger um, uh, to China um, uh, um, uh, secretly, and that's because George Washington sent secret envoys um, to England, um, uh, Governor Morris. Can presidents fire cabin officers at will? Yes, they can. George Washington asserted that power. Can pre do presidents speak for American foreign policy, um, pronouncing our views to the rest of the world? Yes, because George Washington issued a neutrality proclamation. So we read the terse text of Article 2, not in isolation. We read it, in effect, through the special spectacles of George Washington. What George Washington did is iconic. By the way, how many of you knew that George Washington signed his name to an individual mandate that you have to buy something in the private um, market? Because he did. The Militia Act of 1792 said, buy your own musket and flintlock and ammo and, and, and pouch, um, um, so pretty interesting, huh? Um, Supreme Court paid very little attention to it. They should have paid a lot more attention to that because it's George freaking Washington. <laughs> and, did that. and that's part of our unwritten constitution. You laugh because you know it's George Washington and he's, you know, that matters more than Martin Van Buren or Millard Fillmore or whatever. It's George Washington, okay? In the same way that I say it's the Declaration of Independence. Um, final thought. Oh, I do have a chapter that I'm not going to be able to get into on America's feminist constitution and how extraordinary, we the people at the founding, that we the men, and it doesn't today, and that has huge implications for our life. At the founding, no one would think that M Martha Washington or Dolly Madison could succeed their husbands. Like today, um, Barack Obama has two running mates, and one is named Joe, and the other is named Michelle. And she could succeed him. She's a Harvard Law School graduate, and, and so could Hillary Clinton, by the, you know, for that matter. And that wasn't the founder's world. That's a 19th Amendment world that gives you Franklin and Eleanor, Bill and Hillary, Barack and Michelle. It's, it's a different kind of world once women vote. Um, the, oh, but since I mentioned the Affordable Care Act case, the men in that case on the Supreme Court split 42 against that law. It was the three women on the court who all actually voted to uphold it. Um, Obamacare. You could call it Pelosi care, you see, if you wanted, after a woman speaker of the House. Um, in this upcoming election, if the men split, the women will decide. Barack Obama may not get, probably won't get a majority of the men, but he's leading because of the, that's a different, because of the woman's vote. You know, and you have, in the 20th century, um, amendments. I told you about the, the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments, the Civil War amendments after the Emancipation Proclamation, but in the 20th century, when you have an income tax amendment that's about a progressive redistributive income tax, 
And we have a 17th Amendment that means that David Bourne wins and keeps winning in the Senate, not by having to get the Oklahoma state legislators to be for him, but by getting the people of Oklahoma to be for him. Then he cares a little bit more about what the people think than what the state government thinks, and that frees him to be a little bit more nationalist than he would have if you had to keep going back to the Oklahoma state legislature. Um, so you take the Civil War Amendments. Remember what was the, how the Bill of Rights began? Congress shall make no law. It ends with the 10th Amendment. It's a Tea Party states' rights pushback against big government. But the 13th Amendment ends, Congress shall have power. And the 14th Amendment ends, Congress shall have power. And the 15th Amendment ends, Congress shall have power. And the 16th Amendment is a lot of power to have this federal income tax. You'll, some of you in the audience will understand this a little bit later on in, in, you know, in your lives. April 15th will have a special significance for, for you. So the 16th Amendment means more federal power, redistributive power. 17th Amendment, more nationalist projects. 19th Amendment, women vote. 16 plus 17 plus 19. It's unwritten, but that will equal the New Deal, the Great Society, and Obamacare. Because women in general are going to be more pro welfare state, a critic would say nanny state, but that's what we call the gender gap. They tend to favor more government uh, programs. So 16 plus 17 plus 19 equals your modern administrative state. Um, so it's not made up, it's not quite written in so many words, but it's the logical working out. Um, I have a chapter on both political parties and how they fit into the system. Political parties are sort of built into a system uh, in an unwritten way. And here's how I end. I'm not going to say a lot about that. I, I, did, I just had to say something about women, just because that it's such it's a doubling of the franchise. It's, it's, it's a, the next huge democratic um, thing um, after the, the founding and the emancipation. It's epic. Here's how I end. America's unfinished constitution. The constitution of the future, of 2020, of 2121. 22, 22. My friends, if we can get together tonight and really talk seriously about what happened 150 years ago or 225 years ago and take seriously the implications, all that, and constitutional law is about taking seriously stuff that happened a long time ago because it's a way to guide us today. And this is what civic education is all about. You need to understand the past to understand the present and the future. If we can do all that, we need to be equally willing to turn around and think forward into the future. 150 years, 225 years. What should your world, what should your America look like? And I offer a few suggestions in that last chapter. I'm not going to tell you what they are um, here because we just don't have time. But, but maybe just let me end by saying um, that we can be framers for the future. That in the same way that sacrifices were made 200 years ago to give the benefits to us, the framers' posterity, we have an equal responsibility to think about improving our system for our posterity. It's our responsibility, it's our duty, and to do it not just for ourselves, but our posterity. Does the written Constitution say that in so many words? No. But if anything, you know, but, but, but this... This intergenerational obligation, an obligation to think not just about the past, but about the future, I claim is an obvious, indispensable part of America's unwritten constitution. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. so much for your, uh, your speech. Um, would you care to comment on the Obama administration's relative silence on protecting the freedom of speech when it comes to the assault of American diplomats um, in Libya? Uh, so, as much progress, it, it, uh, the question is about the savage attack on American diplomats, partly because we have free speech here in America, and I'm for it. 
uh, free speech. And, and at the end of the day, we can't censor our own conversation, ultimately, just because folks, other folks um, don't like American freedom. We can try individually to be as responsible as, as possible in exercising our free speech. You have a right to do all sorts of really disgusting things. And the government won't shut you down and should never shut you down. But you should shut yourself down before you do some of these disgusting things. Just there's, there isn't, you don't, I, no one can force you to think about the future of posterity, but you have a, you have a responsibility. You know, rights entail responsibilities, and not all these responsibilities are enforced by the government. So I think it, it was a pretty amazing freedom of speech 200 years ago. And people said nasty things and caustic things. They burned uh, George Washington and others, um, and less so Washington, but others in effigy. It was pretty raucous. Because um, we're a kind of raucous people. Um, a free people. Um, here's what's extraordinary. When you compare it, say, to the French Revolution, um, they think theirs was a good revolution. I think not so much. You know, it doesn't end well. No one dies in our American constitutional year. A raucous conversation, you know, a little bit of, of, of aggressive um, action, some mob action and stuff, some, some property damage. No one dies. In that whole year, that began 225 years ago this week, in a whole year, extraordinarily robust, uninhibited, wide open political discourse, sometimes a little nasty, and no one dies. Um, and that's pretty amazing about America. And I wouldn't ever want us to lose that robust tradition. Um, and eventually, I think, you know, we've made a lot of progress in the rest of the world. Eventually, I think this model will catch on. Um, I do commend to you some passages in David Bourne's letter, um, letter to America, um, um, uh, talking about our role in the world and how we need to partner up um, in, in various ways with because we just don't have enough military might to, to smite down sort of every single um, uh, um, uh, uh, person who, who doesn't believe in, in what we do. We will ultimately prevail, I think, by the power of our moral example. And so we have to be sort of steady and resolute and not shut down free speech here. But individually, you are absolutely free to, to criticize, to condemn, to disassociate yourself from people who are really um, evil and nasty and, 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 and using their freedom in ways that are, 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 um, are hateful. Uh, thank you. Uh, do you feel that homosexual couples should have the same rights as heterosexual couples? Personally, yes. America is not there yet. Um, so, um, um, uh, so my book doesn't tell you what I personally believe, but you ask me um, person to person, so I'll, I'll tell you that. Um, but my book says that courts shouldn't get too far out in front of American culture and society when it comes to unenumerated rights. So what did I say about the right of a criminal defendant to take the stand in his own behalf? That courts recognize this only after it became a widespread part of actual practice. And the same is true of proof beyond reasonable doubt and the right to have an appointed counsel and the right in Lawrence versus Texas, if you read it, which is a, a right of, of, of folks to engage in same-sex conduct. What the court says, um, per Justice Kennedy, is um, America has basically come to a point where only 13 of the states prohibit this conduct. Um, 37 allow it. And that wasn't always the case, so there's been a, a change in actual practice. And of the 13 states that prohibit it, actually, in practice, it's almost ne these laws are almost never enforced against consensual conduct in private, and there are reasons why these laws are almost never enforced. So in fact, these laws in general aren't uh, enforced in a widespread way, and therefore, we basically strike them down. That's what Justice Kennedy 
says about criminal prohibitions on um, uh, intimate sexual conduct um, uh, between people of the same uh, sex. Um, and he went, and if that's his logic, that, that that does not lead automatically to gay marriage because gay marriage is not legal in 37 states and, 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 and but if gay marriage increasingly wins approval in state after state after state, um, it's on the ballot in four states in the next election, at a certain point, the Supreme Court may very well say, the consensus has now emerged, the tide has turned, we now recognize this um, as um, a right that actually has bubbled up, bottom up, from actual American practice rather than being announced top down. As a political, I personally, We'll, we'll applaud that. Um, but you, uh, of course, are entitled to a different view of that. My book doesn't take, tell you about that. My book says it will happen and should happen when, if and when enough states actually shift over. If you ask me as a political scientist when that will happen, my prediction would be, um, because things have changed very fast in this area. Sometime, you know, in your lifetime, um, sometime within the next 15 years, that will probably happen because the pace of change in this is actually accelerating. Um, and it, it's pretty, you're living through a social revolution. Here's the, what the political scientist in me says. Don't, you know, don't get mad at me. I'm just a scientist reporting that I'm seeing a, you know, a meteor that's approaching or something if you don't agree with me. Here's, here's the political science data. Older people tend to be freaked out by this, younger people less so, and now here's you know, the, the two thoughts that, that is, proved out, uh, that is um, d uh, um, borne out by the data. As people age, they tend not to change their mind on this so much. If they're, um, um, uh, if they're for um, gay equality now, they're probably not gonna change their mind. They change their mind on other things. When they start paying taxes, they become a little grumpier about taxes. So you're, you're gonna, when, you, when you have kids of your own, you're gonna have uh, some different ideas about kids' rights and other things. You will change your mind on certain things as you grow older, but if you're for gay equality now, you're probably not gonna change your mind. This is, we have enough data actually to know that. And so younger people tend to be for gay equality, older folks not so much. The younger folks won't change their mind. Um, and this is a little bit harsh, but it's a political science truth. Actuarially, the older folks will die first. <coughs> and so what that means is just the political scientist in me making a prediction every year, actually the numbers are gonna change, the poll data, the state practices, um, um, gay marriage has yet to win in a, just a straight out initiative at any state, but it's, I wouldn't be surprised if it won in at least one of the four states where it's on the ballot this, this year. We'll, we'll see, but that's, those are just political science predictions. My normative, what I say in the book is, courts shouldn't get way out ahead of actual practices on the ground in America. And actual practices on the ground change, because society changes. You see these um, superstars here stand up, wearing the uh, the patch, the patch, the crest, and dragon. These are the Society of Fellows. These are the. Is that Michael over there? I can't quite. No, this is this is Nick. Okay. Um, but, but he's one of our fellows. These are okay. uh, students who are invited to join the ICH uh, Society. So. Thank you for being with us. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your um, reaction upon. Um, hearing Justice Roberts' interpretation of the Commerce Clause and healthcare decision, and then what implications do you think that has for uh, the Roberts Court in the future? So, um, if you want to see a few of my thoughts about that particular decision, I wrote an op-ed on Slate.com right after the oral argument, saying that here's what should happen. It should be upheld as a tax, um, with a coalition cutting across political lines with Chief Justice Roberts joined by Justices um, uh, Ginsburg, Kennedy, Sotomayor, and Breyer, that that's what should happen and I, I think actually is the best result. And so I wrote that on slate.com and that's what did happen, so that's why I'm bragging about it because I, I did call it. Um, um, right after the oral argument, and then I wrote a piece that, that right after the, con the decision came down in the LA Times called um, Roberts Reaches for Greatness about this decision. Here's what I liked about it. I didn't like everything in, in the Roberts opinion or you know, in some of the other opinions. Here's what I did like about it. It crossed party lines. 
And I believe political parties are a huge part of our constitutional tradition. Um, I mentioned how enraptured I am by Lincoln er, amendments. Well, those were his party that got those through, the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment, the 15th Amendment. The 14th Amendment is adopted on a strict party line vote. Every single Democrat in Congress votes against the 14th Amendment. Every single Republican except one votes for it. Uh, and the one who voted against it was named Joe Lieberman. No, no, just, um, uh, so <laughs> parties have an important role in our system. They're built into the very architecture of the House and Senate with an aisle and, and they're built into all sorts of rules about um, uh, committee assignments and staff assignments and appointment of who can be on independent agencies. They have to sort of alternate between parties, no more than four members of one party on a seven person agency. So political parties are built into our system and I'm for them. Even when they can be a little unreasonable, they, they actually together, the two party system does stabilize things in certain ways but they're not supposed to be part of the judiciary. Judges shouldn't wear their party affiliations on their sleeves. The way actually people have to run for House and Senate and governorships and other things and presidents as R's or D's, not judges. So one thing that I actually genuinely admire about Chief Justice Roberts' opinion is there was a crossing of party lines. It wasn't a Bush versus Gore, five Republican appointees versus four Democrat appointees, because if it had been, my cynical students would say, Professor, you're a total fraud. You know, you say there's this thing called law, it's not, it's just all politics. You know, look at Bush versus Gore, that was just, you know, a political lineup, and look at this. How, Professor, how many presidential elections are these five conservative justices allowed to undo? That's what my students would have said if it had been five, four along straight party lines, and Roberts understood that, and he didn't do that. He's helping me to actually teach my students there is a thing called law that's more than just politics. And on the Medicare issue, two Democrat appointees crossed over, uh, Justices Kagan and Breyer, so 7-2 on one thing, 5-4 on another thing, and neither was a straight party line vote, and I say amen. I wish there were more of that, and this is a David Boren like idea in the House and Senate, and, and there are some ways we could actually begin to make that happen, but partisanship has a more proper role in the presidency, in the House, and the Senate than it does um, in, in the judiciary. George Washington stood above party, because there weren't presidential parties, but in this respect, most presidents today can't perfectly emulate George Washington. Our great presidents since then have been partisan presidents. Jefferson, Jackson, Lincoln, Reagan, um, so, um, FDR, so presidents have to be, you know, be one party or the other, people in the House and Senate, yes, governors, I understand, but justices, no. So that's what was admirable, it seems to me, about that decision. Hello. Uh, Hello. I'm, uh, I'm a French student from Chad in Central Africa. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, over there we have a constitution of ourselves, but it's been pretty much a mirror to the French constitution. And it was probably written by a French scholar after decolonization. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking if today we had the right to uh, write our own, it would pretty much probably be different than yes. the one we have right now. And I'm thinking if Americans today were allowed to convene for a new constitutional convention, and if they were to write uh, if they were to have uh, the opportunity to have their, their thoughts uh, um, written, I think they would have a different constitution than the one we have today. So uh, would you support or would you, can you comment on, should we have a new constitution in the yes. United States, you know? Yes, and you're from Chad. Yeah. And how interesting, I just talked about Bush versus Gore, um, which is all about this funny little concept of hanging Chad. Um, but that's it, I, I, I digress. Um, uh, um, so, um, when I, I told you that when you're young and when you're old, you, you will change your mind about some things. When I was a young man, I thought, you know, there's so many good ideas and they're being blocked, it's too hard to amend the Constitution. It could be so much better. Now I'm an old man, I think, you know, it could be a lot worse. And here's one thing that I have noticed about our constitutional amendments. It's been very hard to do them, not very many of them, 
Almost all of them have made the system better. Almost no bad amendments, except for prohibition maybe, which we got rid of. And, and that's pretty extraordinary. Maybe the bar is set a little too high, but it has filtered out, I think, a lot of bad ideas. I think many reforms could happen that are needed reforms without formal constitutional amendment. I believe that the most dysfunctional um, um, uh, element of our current system is actually the entrenched filibuster, and it's actually a relatively new phenomenon. I think the rule of 60 was not nearly so absolute and, and, and widespread when David Bourne was in the Senate as it is even now. So it's metastasized in your lifetime, and we could change it. So without a constitutional amendment. And in fact, I think we could change it by a simple majority vote in the Senate as long as the, 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 um, the presiding officer made a point of order ruling that were upheld. Um, so um, we could have genuine filibuster reform, which I think would be huge um, without a constitutional amendment. If you wanted to have direct election of the presidency, I talk in my last chapter about two different ways of achieving that actually without a formal constitutional amendment. I don't know if David Boren knows this, but as in fact, we had de, de facto direct election of senators in a whole bunch of states before the 17th Amendment. The Oregon plan, um, primaries in one party states. The Lincoln-Douglas debates were an approximation of direct election of senators. The parties told you in advance whom they would name to the US Senate, and if you liked Lincoln, you voted Republican for a state legislature. If you liked Douglas, you vote Democrat for state legislature. It wasn't perfect direct election, but it was an improvisation. So there are um, lots of things that we could do even short of formal constitutional amendment that I think could make the system better. Since I'm here in Oklahoma, Mickey Edwards, a distinguished former congressperson from Oklahoma, he happens to be a, a Republican, so this is not a partisan thing that I'm putting forth, has a whole series of reforms that, that he's proposed. President Boren has some reform ideas that do not require a constitutional amendment. So I do think our system is in deep need of reform. Campaign, a sensible way of thinking about campaign finance. There are lots of things, but they don't all require constitutional amendments. And the old man in me now is a little bit more anxious about, constitution, about a constitutional convention than the young man um, uh, who would have answered your question differently 25 years ago. Well, Professor Barr has agreed to sign some books outside. Uh, so I want to leave a little bit of time for him to do that. Let's thank him for that extraordinary thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, I'll come back, I promise. <laughs> the uh, ICH staff gave everyone who put down their email address and hashtagged us a number and they drew out of the pot, and it was someone named David Postick who has won this book, so if you're here, come get it, it's for you. Thank you all for coming out on a Tuesday night. Happy Constitution Week. Stay tuned for more programming from the ICH. Good night.